Aaron is the CTO founder of Verica, a, a chaos engineering startup, and is a frequent author, consultant, and speaker in the space. So we are glad that Aaron has joined us today. So without further delay, over to you, Aaron. Well, thank you very much for the the kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to speak at Agile India. You know, uh, the program uh, for Chaos Day is quite amazing. So I'm honored to speak here. Let me go ahead and share my slides. Today we're going to talk about security in chaos engineering. Um, below, you'll see at the bottom of every slide, you should see my Twitter handle at Aaron Reinhardt. Um, and behind me, you should see my email, as well as my email should be at the end as well. All right. So some of the things we're going to cover today are um, how we combat complexity in software. Uh, we're going to go over chaos engineering, talk, you know, walk, walk, uh, walk towards security chaos engineering through uh, building a foundation on chaos engineering. Talk a bit about the role of security and resilience. Uh, and then we'll talk about security chaos engineering. A little bit of uh, info about me. I am the CTO and co-founder of Verica. Um, uh, my co-founder is actually Casey Rosenthal, the creator of Chaos Engineering, uh, and they ran the Chaos Engineering teams at Netflix. Uh, and I, um, before I co-founded Verica with Casey, uh, I was the former chief security architect at United Health Group, for the largest healthcare company in the world, the largest private healthcare company in the world. I also spent uh, my career, uh, throughout my career, I was mostly a software engineer b before I got into security. Uh, but I, I had, um, uh, parts of my career I spent at NASA Safety and Reliability Engineering, Department of Defense, and a few other private uh, sector businesses. I'm a freaking speaker and author on chaos engineering and security. Uh, I just finished the O'Reilly book on security chaos engineering. It comes out. I'll give, I'll give everyone a link uh, at, towards the end of the presentation to, to make sure they get a copy of that. Um, but I'm also, I also wrote chapter 20 of Security Chaos Engineering in the most recent uh, Chaos Engineering book. Um, and yeah, and I'm the leader behind Chaos Slinger, the open source tool that applied chaos engineering to security. Right. So... Just, just to sort of, sort of break around on, on what we're going to head into here is that, um, at least from the problem space, incidents, outage, and breaches are costly. I mean, that's not new. That's that's not really news to anyone. Uh, but they seem to be happening more and more often, um, and that's what kind of what we're going to talk about today. Um, it's it's an obvious problem. Um, you can go to, uh, to any any news outlet of your choice, and and um, our, our services and technology uh, seem to be encountering outages uh, in, in, in uh, incidents on a regular basis. So why do they seem to be happening more often? Well, uh, it's important to actually understand the complexity in software and how and where that comes from. So our systems have essentially be, uh, evolved beyond our human ability to mentally model their behavior. So if you've never seen uh, these diagrams, so what you see in front of you, the Amazon.com and Netflix, you, every dot is actually a microservice. Okay, so... All those dots are microservices that facilitates um, Amazon.com and Netflix. And this should just be Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google, the Fang um, sort of companies that were doing, uh, you know, sort of building these large um, microservice architectures. Um, and the problem with uh, uh, with with uh, the with the um, sort of the advent of cloud continuous delivery uh, and uh, and uh, microservice architectures is our systems now are so large, they change so rapidly, and it's very difficult for a human to mentally model and understand its behavior. Um, well, now it's no longer just Amazon and Netflix. Now everyone else is picking this up and starting to encounter uh, the, com the, com uh, the, the negative effects of complexity at scale. So uh, Cindy Decker, likes the, uh, he wrote this book called Drift into Failure, wrote a couple other great books in the space. He's one of the world's authorities on safety engineering and complex systems. Uh, he actually uh, writes a lot about airline accident investigations. So never read any of his books on, on, a, on a plane flight. But um, he likes to say that the growth of complexity in society has gotten ahead of our, our understanding of how complex systems work and fail. I'm going to dig more into this term, complex systems, and, and how it applies to software. 
Uh, but Sydney Decker, a lot of Sydney Decker's work directly applies uh, to what we do. Um, so what do I mean by complex systems? Well, you know, what you see in front of you, this is actually a snapshot from Netflix's Visceral. Uh, it's an observability tool written by actually Casey Rosenthal. He wrote the first version of it. But basically, well, the reason why I have this up on the screen is, is that this is a, uh, when I say complexity, it's very difficult to ascertain uh, for any, any human what's going on at any given point in this microservice architecture. Each, each circle, each sort of larger circle is a microservice and, and all the dots of request. It's very difficult to understand all the intertwined relationships and how, um, you know, how other services affect each other, especially in terms of cascading failure. So where does this complexity sort of come from? Well, actually, a lot of the more modern techniques that we uh, are, such as um, immutable infrastructure, um, such as, you know, circuit breaker patterns, infra code, you know, continuous delivery, CICD, auto canaries, feature flags. These are all, I mean, these are all helping us deliver value to customer faster. And that's what we need to be doing. But it's also increasing the, uh, how, the complexity of how, the process in which we build software. Well. What about security? Well, the state of security is still mostly monolithic. We think about security design and architecture in a monolithic sense. It's getting better. Um, Sunil Yu, uh, Bank of America in the United States, he wrote a model called the Distributed Immutable Ephemeral Model. Um, and, um, you know, th there it's starting the that kind of uh, software engineering based approach to security, starting to pick up speed, but it's still not quite there yet. It's not widely adopted. Like DevSecOps is not is 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 beginning to pick up um, steam, but it's not not yet widely adopted. And another issue with sort of how we approach um, you know uh, security is that um, is that we still love to think our, our solutions are mostly expert systems. What I mean by that is, is they require some kind of domain knowledge, I meaning you can't just um, go pick up a Palo Alto firewall and immediately start using it. Um, it requires some kind of training around Panorama. And how how Palo Alto uh, firewalls operate in order to uh, in order to function for them to function. Whereas a lot of your so a lot of software engineering tools, you can just go to GitHub uh, and then start rocking something new, a new piece of code. And we're still predominantly designing uh, and implementing security in a stateful way in a mostly stateless world. Uh, so uh, we we have this issue of this gap in how we design and build security and how uh, we're building and delivering software. So what is the answer to all this complexity? Well, is it the logical answer would be to, to simplify, right? Well, uh, newsflash, software has officially taken over. Uh, so what you see on the right-hand side here is you see actually the new OSI model. It's software, 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 software. Um, software has officially taken over just about the entire stack. So another important thing to remember about software is that it only ever increases the complexity. And, you know, there, there's an old saying in software that there's no problem in software another layer of abstraction can't solve. Well, at some point, these, the, 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 you know, our, um, the abstractions start to break at speed and scale. So software complexity. So the nature of software complexity was, uh, was well written about in the 1980s. There's a paper uh, called No Server Bullet. It articulated, you know, the two different domains of complexity in software. One is essential complexity, the other is accidental. Essential complexity basically states that organizations are destined to, uh, so it, essential complexity is based on um, concepts similar such as Conway's law. What I mean by that is that organizations are destined to design computer systems that reflect the, the way they communicate. Well, the way the, the business that you work in or, um, you know, uh, makes, you know, the, the way the business operates, uh, 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 mirrors itself in how the systems that are being built. So you can't really change the complexity that's being inherited from the business unless you change the business. Whereas accidental complexity comes from uh, the the process of how we build things and put things together as humans. Uh, and there are two different schools here uh, of thought is that some folks believe you can actually reduce the complexity, uh, but really uh, most people think you're just moving it around. But the answer is not to reduce it or to move around. The answer is actually to learn to navigate it understand the system and understand the difference between how you think the system works and how it works in reality. So Dr. David Woods is one of the world's uh, foremost authorities on resilience engineering in medicine. Uh, and it's so, it's so remarkable to read anything from him because it, it makes exact uh, precise sense in software. But 
He says, as the complexity of a system increases, the accuracy of any single agent or human's own model of the system decreases. So what does all this have to do with my systems? Well, the question is, is I ask you, is how well do you really understand your systems? I mean, really. Because in reality, you have to remember systems engineering is a very, 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 very messy exercise. And I have theories on why uh, we, we, we don't remember this, but it's a very messy exercise. So in the beginning, we, uh, you know, I, I, before I co-founded Verica, I was an architect. That was my, my function. And you know, we love to work in diagrams and representations of the system. But in reality, the system never, ever looks like that. You know, so in the beginning, we always have the, we'll have these nice 3D diagrams. We've got that. We got the code. We've got the image. We've got the, you know, the staging and production environments. The plan is clear, right, from day zero. Well, the system almost never uh, reflects uh, um, what we think it is. Because after a few months, what ends up happening is, is that we start to learn about how the system actually functions and operates through a series of unforeseen events. Uh, and I remember, so, so, um, so I'm going to tell a story here in a second, but uh, so after a few weeks, after a few months of going live, you know, uh, there's, a, there, there's an outage on the payments API, you have to hard code a token. Uh, the day after that, of course you go back and actually fix that, right? Uh, day after that, there's, um, you know, uh, the, the web application firewall had an outage and it started disabling traffic. You know, it's this, you start to learn about what you really didn't know about your system through these unforeseen events, right? Uh, and it kind of just continues to go and go and go on further and further, right? Well, um, our systems slowly drift into a state of unknown. Uh, and that's really what we're, we're trying to combat with chaos engineering. So trying to navigate this complexity and, of course, correct our understanding of how things are, are really working. So one of the stories I was going to tell is that um, I... Um, Early on in the, our startup journey, we had a conversation with the world's largest payment providers, and they were telling us about how they had this legacy system. Uh, it was it was uh, it, it it was the the core core application, a flagship application for the company. Uh, it made all the money, but they needed more flexibility, and they they wanted the benefits of Kubernetes, right? So they were worried about moving off of this legacy system. Uh, onto an, uh, something they weren't sure about, right? That they didn't really trust, right? Because the engineers in the legacy system understand, they understand the, the system. It really has an outage. Uh, they're competent in the technology. Um, they're comfortable. They trust that system. But I started asking the question myself is that, was that legacy system always that way, right? Or did it actually, did was it through a, a series of unforeseen events that they actually learned how it actually operated and got more comfortable and confident in the way it functioned. And partly that's where we're coming from with chaos engineering is that it's a proactive way, you know, to discover those same sort of unforeseen events without encountering customer pain or, pay, or, or pain as an engineer. So our systems is, uh, in the end have become more complex and messy than we remember them. So what does all this stuff have to do with security? I'm, I'm getting around to it. So the norm, it's important to remember that the normal condition of a system is to fail. It's humans that keep it from failing. Uh, but humans, uh, a core part of, of how we operate is we need failure to learn and grow. It's essential. And it's no different for the things that we've built. Uh, Scott Sagan, I stole this from John Allspa. Scott Sagan um, likes to say that things that, have never happened before seem to be happening all the time. Uh, and that's sort of the ethos of, of what's happening. So how do we typically discover when our security measures fail? Well, we typically discover through security incidents of some kind. Um, security incidents are not an effective measure of detection because often it's already too late. Uh, and um, we have to be more proactive about that. So no system is, is inherently, this is actually uh, taken from Sydney Decker, uh, but no, it's important to remember that no system is inherently secure by default. It actually takes humans to make them that way. Um, a lot of times in the security world, we uh, people often point to human error and human factors as being sort of root causes, and that's, that's a fallacy um, because actually it's humans that actually are the ones that uh, create security and create safety. Um, it's also important to recognize in terms of chaos engineering and incidents is sort of changing your approach is that people operate differently from a cognitive perspective when they expect things to fail. 
So when there's a security incident, um, people tend to freak out, right? They're worried about uh, that this might be the security breach that, you know, that, that code I pushed last night. I knew there was an issue with that module I got or that, that image I got from a third party repo. Um, you know, like it, um, people are freaking out and, and they're worried about their jobs that they think they might have caused something. This is not a good learning environment here, right? People are freaking out. And often the focus is not on let's figure out what happened. It's it's get that thing back up and running. We're losing money as a business. So chaos engineering, we do not do here. We do it here, right? We do it when there is no active incident, when there's no active outage, right? We do it to proactively understand, does the system work the way we think it does? And uh, this type of environment, it's much easier to, for people to have an open mind and be aware and, and learn things about the system. Because that's the point of it. So chaos engineering. Several people, several great speakers have talked uh, today about chaos engineering. Um, so I'm going to try to tell you a few things you might not know. Um, I'll start with the definition. The definition of chaos engineering is the discipline of experimentation on distributed systems in order to build confidence in the system's ability to withstand turbulent conditions. Well, chaos engineering is about establishing order, not creating chaos. We're, we're establishing order from the chaos. So no chaos engineering talk would be, uh, would be right without explaining chaos monkey. So a lot of people will tell me, Aaron, um, you know, we can't do chaos engineering. We're barely doing DevOps or CI. You know, um, like, you know, chaos engineering is such an advanced thing. Well, really, it's actually not, right? Actually, Netflix in 2008, when they created, oh, 2008, 2009, when they created Chaos Monkey, they were just transitioning from DVD, shipping DVDs in the mail to streaming their, their movies on um, on the cloud in AWS. At the time when they were when they were doing that and building that architecture, AMIs were just disappearing. There was a feature of AWS at that point in time. And they Netflix just made this huge bet, and they needed they needed to ensure that you know when that kind of behavior occurred, that their services were resilient to that kind of uh, that kind of failure. So really, what it did it put well defined problems in front of engineers. It says it, during business hours, my service can be exposed to this type of problem. Okay, fine. I will design it to handle that failure mode gracefully and, and to anticipate it. And that's really, so really it's about putting well-defined problems in context in front of engineers so they can solve it. Because it turns out the better you define a problem, uh, it, it, engineers are more likely to solve it. Um, so it's it, Netflix is, so chaos engineering at Netflix was born out of cloud transformation. Who's doing chaos engineering? I track a little over 13, 1400 companies now doing it. Um, every, everything from healthcare to banks to, uh, to to media, to streaming, to retail, uh, and this is a worldwide thing. Uh, so principlesofchaos.org is important to recognize because this is the rule set. It's very important to read and understand this before you get started in chaos engineering. So uh, there are currently three books. Uh, the Netflix wrote, the Casey wrote the first one, which is when he was in Netflix. Uh, and uh, we just finished the O'Reilly, official O'Reilly book on uh, Chaos Engineering, the official animal book on it. Um, if anybody wants a copy of that, I'll, there's a link to get a free download copy of that at the end of the presentation. But also um, the Security Chaos Engineering O'Reilly book will be out at uh, the beginning of next month. Um, so I'll be more than happy uh, to, to hook anybody up with that if you're interested. So uh, instrumenting chaos. So uh, there's we like to loosely break down instrumentation into two buckets, right? There's testing which is the verification or validation of something you already know to be true or false. It's a binary thing. We know what we're looking for before we go looking for it. Whereas experimentation, we're trying to derive new information that we previously did not know, the sort of the unknown, unknown kind of kind of scenario. We're trying to make sure in the form of a hypothesis using sort of Western science methodology, we're saying if the system were to encounter X problem that we believe we've designed Y to be the result. And we believe that's how it operates. That's how it should operate. Uh, and with chaos engineering, what we do is actually exercise that that experiment. Uh, and the point is to draw, derive new information about the system. So some pitfalls about chaos engineering that you should you should be wary of is that 
Um, it's not about breaking things on purpose. It never has been about breaking things on purpose. The purpose of chaos engineering is not to break things on purpose. Uh, if, if anything, we're trying to fix it on purpose. Casey loves to say that I'm pretty sure if I, if I went around, uh, I'm pretty sure I won't have a job very long if I go around breaking things all day. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not about breaking things on purpose, nor do you have to do it in production. Uh, so what is security chaos engineering? Well, I'll break it down quickly. It's, it's, it's actually not a whole lot different. The use cases and, and perspective is just a slightly different. So uh, ho hope is not a strategy. So hope is not an effective strategy. Um, I, I just, I, this, is, this is a constant theme in chaos engineering talks. But the point is, is that hoping, uh, why well, I started with uh, applying Netflix's chaos engineering to cybersecurity? Because my concern was, is that, you know, we build all these um, security controls uh, into our into our applications, into our infrastructure, and but we rarely ever we're kind of hoping that it works when it needs to work. We're not exercising it in the events and constructs in which it must operate, meaning an incident. Um, so we can't. Engineers don't believe in two things: we don't believe in luck, and we don't believe in hope. Uh, so it's about understanding. Uh, where the gaps are before an adversary does. So what we're trying to do essentially with security chaos engineering is that the majority, so the majority of your data breaches uh, are and even most, if you look at malicious code, the majority of malicious code, I'd say 90, 95% requires some kind of low hanging fruit to exist, meaning a misconfigured port, a misconfigured uh, permissions or a user or our network path. Um, things that just shouldn't exist that we think we could be planned for and solved for, but, uh, the idea is we're, we're, is we're trying to inject those conditions proactively into the system to ensure actually those controls we put in place to detect things like a misconfigured port, detect it and block it, and we're notified. Uh, and um, th that's really the ethos behind it. Um, so we often, we often misremember what our systems really are. As a result, the opportunity for access to mistakes increases is that you know, uh, it's not, I described this a little bit earlier, but the speed and scale that, that we're building software in today's world, uh, it's, it's one, it's difficult to continually build and change software as a software engineer, but it's even more difficult to align security with that changing ecosystem. Uh, and uh, so it's not just that we misremember it, it's the speed and scale that is causing, uh, further causing issues. Uh, so it's really about continuously verifying that our security works the way we think it does. And like I said a little bit ago, is it's about trying to ensure we can actually we can actually catch those uh, conditions, those low hanging fruit conditions that actually make malicious code successful. That we can catch them before an adversary can take advantage of it. Uh, our goal that we're trying to go after is we're trying to reduce the uncertainty in our security posture through building confidence in how the system actually functions. And, so some use cases for chaos engineering for security. Um, predominantly, when I started at United Health Group uh, exploring this space, I really started with, uh, as the chief security architect, I was always concerned about my guidance for an application or a product. They would come to me with diagrams and, and, and information about the system. I would try my best to give them the best possible security designed into that uh, into, from the information they gave me. But I was never sure if what I recommended actually ever got implemented or it was effective. I needed a way to sort of skip through all the people in the process in the sort of words on paper and ask the computer a question. Hey, when I inject this condition into the system, can, are, you, are you effective? Can you catch it? I, I, are you designed appropriately? Uh, and it, it, it can't just be a point in time. It has to be continuously similar to a regression test is that as uh, you scale and, and as security controls are often implemented uh, the same way in multiple environments, there's a lot of drift between environments. And so you have to continuously validate that a control works uh, throughout all its different ecosystems. So control validation is a big area. Uh, instant response is also um one of the most uh, one of the areas I got a lot of value from uh, applying secure, uh, security chaos engineering. Uh, also, uh, one of the biggest gaps in uh, in application security and software security in general is the ability to observe security events in software. Uh, and so, one of the things that uh, chaos engineering experiments can do for security is that highlight areas where we didn't have log events, or where the log events didn't make sense, or where we weren't able to correlate an alert. 
um, it, because we didn't have the right data or the tool wasn't providing enough information to, to, to trigger a correlation. Uh, and lastly, every chaos experiment, whether availability or security-based, uh, has compliance value. So make sure you keep a copy uh, in, in a high-integrity way uh, of each uh, of each experiment's run, uh, and you can use that for compliance audits. Uh, so instant response. The issue with instant response is response is is that we're no matter how much money sort of you spend uh, on security, no matter how many humans you have. Um, you still don't know a lot. I mean, security incidents are very subjective. You don't know where it's going to happen, why it's happening, who's trying to get in, how they're going to get in, and what they're going to do to get in. You just don't know those things, no matter how much money and effort you put behind it. Because you're kind of sitting there waiting for an event to occur to ascertain whether or not it was effective or not. So, uh, and a lot of times we don't account for cascading failures in, in terms of uh, security incidents and, and breaches, uh, and we're not looking for them. So, like, um, so one of the things that we you can use security chaos engineering for is to proactively inject the event, and inject the signal into the process, and now you have a you have you have a point that you know where the event started. So now you can measure: did you have enough right? Did you have the right people on? Uh, did you have enough people on call? Uh, did they have the right skills? Uh, how long did it take for them to resolve the incident? Did the tools and technologies provide the right information and context to the team? Because you're in control of the signal, you now have an ability to sort of manage and understand uh, what normally is a subjective uh, process where you're kind of waiting for things to happen. So it's really about flipping the model. So instead of the postmortem being after the fact, it's the postmortem becomes the, the preparation exercise. And we can learn about how brittle our systems are proactively and fix them before they manifest into painful uh, outages and incidents. So uh, this gets me to Chaos Slinger. Chaos Slinger was about four years ago. Uh, I was part of a team that wrote the first ever application of Chaos Engineering, or Netflix's Chaos Engineering to cybersecurity. Uh, it works mostly for AWS. It's open source. Um, it has, uh, there's example code, and I'm going to go through a quick example here in a second. Uh, but it's predominantly serverless. It's a Lambda-based application. Uh, it has an opt-in, opt-out model. Most chaos engineering tools have an opt-in, opt-out model. The reason for that is that you want to be able to control the blast radius. For example, you may not want to inject a misconfigured port on a on your edge, for, for example. Um, but uh, you can check that out. The project is now um, the United Health Group, I think, no longer supports it. They have their own version of it that they utilize. But uh, everything you need... Uh, to write your own chaos experiments for security is in is there in the framework is in the four uh, the three functions uh, that are in the example framework. So an example, uh, so we call this example Port Slinger. So when we open sourced Chaos Slinger, we needed an example that everyone could understand. Uh, whether you're a software engineer, a network engineer, uh, a tech technology executive, an SRE, um, everybody kind of understands what a firewall does, right? For some odd reason, misconfigured uh, and unauthorized port changes happen all the time, still in 2020. Um, so our hypothesis is, is that, is that uh, if uh, a misconfigured unauthorized port change would occur, that our, uh, as a security team, this is something we plan for, and this is a very easy thing that we expect to, to solve for, is we've been solving firewalls for 20 years, is that uh, we expect it to, the, the misconfiguration to be able to, be detected and immediately blocked. Um, so, yeah, so if someone accidentally and maliciously introduced a misconfigured port, then we would immediately detect block and alert on the event. Well, so we wrote Chaos Slinger. So it's three functions. It's Slinger, it's Tracker, and Generator. Uh, uh, generator does target acquisition. Um, uh, Slinger actually makes the changes, and Tracker tracks the changes and reports it to Slack. Well, so what we're actually doing is that we started uh, introducing um, – a uh, misconfigured port sort of event into our, into our AWS environments. As a company, we were very new to AWS. Uh, and um, so we, we, we started experimenting and started injecting these conditions into the, into uh, our, our environments. We started actually, so we, like I said before, we expected our, our firewalls to immediately detect and block it. Well, that only worked about 60% of the time. Um, so that was the first thing we learned. The second thing we learned uh, and actually, the firewall issue was actually a drift issue between our non-commercial and commercial software. Uh, but that that kind of stuff happens. Um, the second thing we learned was that our cloud-native commodity config management tool caught it and blocked it every time. 
So the thing we're barely paying for was more effective than things we were paying for. Um, three, we expected both the config tool and the firewall to uh, throw good log data to a security log event or a SIM. We didn't have a SIM at the time. Um, and so that actually happened. That was successful. That correlated an alert. The alert went to our security operations center and the analysts there didn't know which AWS environment it came from. They, they got the alert, but they didn't know what to do with it because um, we didn't, uh, like I said, we were new to AWS at the time. And um, as an engineer, you can think, well, you can just map back the IP address and figure out what environment it came from. But that could take 5, 10, 15, 30 minutes. Uh, not to mention if SNAT is, is in place, if SNAT is in place, it might take you an hour, an hour and a half, two hours. Uh, when you are a Fortune 500 company, a Fortune 10 company, uh, millions of dollars are being lost per minute, you know, and that could be 30 million. It could be $60 million. Uh, well, well, in this case, uh, there was no loss of revenue. There was, there was no outage. We proactively discovered that these things weren't working the way we expected them to. And we're able to fix them and learn from it and, and it not be a blame, name and shame type of experience. So at every stage in, in sort of the process, we, we sort of ended up writing additional experimentation. Um, but um, we're trying to, like I said, we're trying to understand uh, uh, whether or not our security uh, apparatus, the technologies, the humans uh, uh, operate the way we expect. So I'll leave you with one last uh, sort of uh, thing to ponder on. Is that John Alspa, you know, which he, John Alspa is one of the fathers of DevOps and as well as a resilience engineer for software. He likes to really sort of uh, make people pause and think and, and really think about looking for better answers instead of always, uh, uh, instead of looking for better answers, start asking better questions. And that's really what we're doing with Chaos Engineering. We're asking the system better questions. Um, and there is the book information. If anyone's interested in uh, getting a copy of the book, go to verica.io slash book. Uh, and you'll get a free copy of, of the book. Oh, I get that. So I'm assuming that I just, oh, you're back. okay, back. Hey, hi, do I just uh, do I just sort of go in the the Q and A? Is that okay? Or are you going to read the questions? Yeah, yeah. So you can you can also go there yourself, but uh, I can ask. Uh, I can you know uh, call it out right now. Uh, so there is one question: How is security chaos testing different from penetration testing? Sure, that's a question I get a lot. I actually have written a lot. Of, I've actually written a lot on the topic. Um, but so there, in terms of, uh, offensive testing, there is penetration testing, there is red teaming, there is purple teaming, uh, and there's breach and attack simulation tools. Uh, so these, none of those, none of the, by the way, none of these tools are, uh, all these tools are, are really, uh, great ways to find objective information about the system, but, how is it different than penetration testing? Well, it, partly it's the the goals of what we're trying to achieve, but it's also um, uh, uh, so penetration testing. We're really the goal is trying to get in, try to expose a flaw within the system. And there's there's a difference between the idea of what we think pen testing is and how it, how it functions, and um, and how people are doing it in reality. Is that pen testing typically um, is especially in terms of software. Uh, is um, uh, is not really tuned well for distributed systems. Uh, and this is part of the issue with purple. So purple teaming, red teaming, penetration testing, there's a lot of overlap. So, so the pen testing is a technique within red teaming. So red teaming is something that people still do, but uh, people have transitioned more to what they call a purple team. Well, a purple team exercise is really, instead of the red teaming just just banging away and, and beating up my environment and telling me all the things that are wrong uh, that I have to fix. It, it's the idea was that blue and purple would merge. I mean, blue and red would merge uh, would mean defense and offense would merge and share information and build a better understanding. 
Um, but purple teaming really doesn't. What, what purple teaming really doesn't uh, hasn't evolved into software. It's really more of a traditional sort of data center kind of network and Active Directory kind of uh, corporate infrastructure kind of uh, you know test. What people mostly do is drop malware on a desktop once a quarter. Um, but what, what the world I would like to see uh, is that uh, chaos engineering, breach and attack simulation, these these newer techniques provide an opportunity for pen testing to drive more value. And so chaos engineering for security in particular is we're not trying to attack and get in the system. We're trying to inject the conditions by which we expect them to operate, if that makes sense. We're trying to inject like, I know that my firewall should be able to detect a misconfigured port. I, so I inject it, right? Or I inject, uh, or I uh, I know that this Kubernetes pod shouldn't be able to c- communicate to this uh, whatever thing, or should be able to communicate externally, or shouldn't be able to pull pull from an unknown repository. Um, so we actually write the test and inject it, and 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 observe whether or not uh, the system functioned and operated uh, as it was supposed to. So it's failure injection, I guess, versus attacking. Uh, and when you're attacking a system, especially a distributed system, you make a lot of noise. It's very difficult to ascertain what worked, what didn't, and as an engineer, I'm more interested in the context of what worked or what didn't than I am uh, that you were able to get in because uh, the context is more uh, constructive for me to be able to know what to fix. Um, okay, so this is another one from Naresh. So this one's from Naresh. There are several AI tools in the space of predictive uh, you know, anomaly detection. What is your take on them? Can they coexist with chaos engineering? So, uh, so I'm to be very. I'm an engineer by trade, so I'm to be very opinionated on this. So, um, using a, uh, using machine learning DL. So part of the issue with like, there's a lot of solutions out there like that say, let me give me all your security log data and information, and I will predict the next breach that's going to happen. Well, this that has one major flaw in its assumption is that you're assuming you have the right data to begin with. So one of the biggest issues in software security is that is actually the logs and events. Is that um, is that writing security events for software? You have to write three layers of logic. You have to write the web tier, the data layer, and the business logic layer. Now, uh, between Go and Rust and Python and Java, there is a different there's different frameworks on how on how you do that. Um, they don't map well to, well to each other. It's very custom in nature. Even Java six and Java seven, they both have frameworks, but they they differ, right? So it's it's um, so what it's it's um, so we lack a lot of observable events in self, from a software security perspective. And it's one of the biggest gaps in, from my perspective. Um, so what was I going with that? Um, uh, I think I answered the question. What was the question? Oh, AI tools. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I just. Uh, elapsed. Um, so a lot of these tools out there will say we can inject all the data, all your data, and then predict the future. Well, you're sim- well, the problem is we don't have the data for software. You might be able to do some of that for infrastructure stuff that ha- doesn't change uh, ten times a day or hundred times a day. And you know, software we're changing sometimes to ten, a hundred thousand times a day. You know, and um, it's uh, you know, um, from my perspective, I find it uh, very hard to believe. There's probably some value in it, though. Yeah, I'm not saying there's no value. I'm just saying that, you know, being able to be in the, uh, the silver bullet is is probably, you know, saying you can predict the future, you know, assumes you kind of understand where you're at, and we don't. Cool. Uh, I think uh, that's about it then. Uh, so thanks, Aaron, for sharing your experience with us. Hey, this is just Naresh here. I wanted to quickly jump in and uh, thank Aaron. Uh, we uh, we were really really sad, Aaron, that we lost you when we shift, when we had to uh, kind of uh, go ahead with the conference during the pandemic. We decided we'll still go ahead, and uh, we were pretty sad that we lost you uh, because you couldn't travel. And I was so glad when you reached out again when we decided to go virtual uh, on your own without us uh, following up. So I greatly appreciate that. Uh, that you. It's a great uh, event. The rest is a great event. You guys put on a great show. You know, I mean, look at the talent you got on the schedule. Uh, you know, 
I myself will be watching a few other events today. So awesome! No, but I just wanted to personally thank you, and uh, you can see the light cloud over there. Uh, people really appreciate your talk. So thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you for having me.